Spanish, uh, who knows lots of things about poetry market or book markets in uh, Romania and in France. We have uh, Sinisha Sokarin, who knows things about the Serbian market, Martin Feller from Switzerland, and Ivan Dimitro from Bulgaria. So with uh, so many points of view and uh, information, I guess we could uh, uh, very easily start a conversation uh, that uh, at least uh, could uh, point out uh, the, the essential uh, things that uh, uh, are involved in this uh, selling and buying uh, poetry, poetry books. Uh, I start by making a sentence, uh, and this is that uh, since we have uh, the economic crisis from uh, 2009 and uh, for some countries even earlier, uh, the first thing uh, the common man uh, had to renounce was the books. I've seen this uh, myself. Uh, uh, so I, I was a man who used to buy books uh, every month and uh, now I'm buying books uh, once, two times a year. Uh, why do you think this happened? Uh, and it, did, do you think it happened in France or for my Dr. Well, uh, thank you for inviting me to this round the table. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that maybe um, you should have invited not poets like us, but maybe editors yes. and distributors. We had editors in uh, so people, people involved in this uh, market of... Uh, no, but even as a poet, you're a good observer. You know what happens with your books, with other people's books, uh, and uh, you know the public, uh, so you're not a foreigner. <laughs> The yes, topic. yes, that's true. <laughs> I know that, as you said, the, the situation in France where I lived for a while and then in Romania, as many of you here present. Um, what I would say is that uh, uh, the so-called dramatic situation with the poetry books is not involved, it's not related in my view to the economic crisis of the last, of the last two, five or four years. It's a situation that uh, has lasted in the last uh, maybe almost 20 years in Europe. Because before, uh, poets uh, had, uh, would uh, feel comfortable in their position in the cultural field, I, was, I, I would say. But afterwards, there was a transformation uh, in the public perception, in the cultural perception of the role, of the position of poets into the cultural uh, metabolism. And uh, poetry uh, uh, was a little bit uh, put aside by other genres, other literary genres which seemed more important. And uh, this, uh, this created a, a sort of vicious circle. I mean, because uh, uh, poetry was not so well considered as before, uh, poets themselves started to consider less well than before, and uh, uh, this uh, uh, gave uh, birth to a situation where books of poetry uh, started to sell less and less. And uh, I think that it is a temporary situation, and that poets have started to realize what is happening, and they have started to uh, react against the situation. Because I think it's a temporary um, uh, change in the in the um, uh, cultural uh, hierarchy uh, of uh, of what is written today. Um, prose writers seem more important. Uh, why? Why do they seem more important? We should ask ourselves because uh, they seem to give a, an analysis, a comprehension of what is happening today with our lives. Uh, <coughs> Uh, today's reality and why poetry is uh, less uh, uh, estimated uh, than before. Maybe because uh, people have lost uh, a sense of metaphysics or a sense of uh, important major themes uh, related to their existence, to life and death, and to other major uh, subjects uh, of uh, culture. It's a, it's a huge question. Uh, but I, I would uh, say that it's a complex uh, problem which is not related only to 
economic crisis, to editorial market, but it's also related to ourselves, to our own position as writers, as uh, poets, uh, in front of our uh, profession, of, what, of our role, or of our... Uh, yes, production, mm -hmm. huh? production. Eva, you've published uh, a poetry book, a novel, uh, uh, the plays. What, uh, what made you happier and what did you sell most? In fact? The most, of course. Uh, like poetry, like it was published by a very small publishing house and it's just like, uh, I think in Bulgaria, most of you are publishing poetry only, I don't know, it's only as a step of your uh, own, you know, just uh, growth, mm -hmm. but not like about uh, commercial. Not something serious. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, as a matter of your own. Um, and, and yeah, in the last uh, four years, like I think the Bulgarian market is going better and better, but in 2008 there was like 200% you know, oh. low, which is very, very much, and, yeah. But yeah, um, I also agree that it's just a question that I think, mm, mm, like a lot of poems themselves, they're, uh, like, kind of living in micro-communities and have a micro-audience, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're writing more for the other poets uh, than uh, to the audience, which... I also see as a reason. It's the same in Romania. It's the same in Serbia. Yeah. It's like when you're going to reading, you you know like the uh, eighty percent of the audience, you know. <laughs> yeah, we buy, buy books when they give them to you. <laughs> <laughs> and you mean, and in Serbia, it's like for there's no market actually. No market. It's like a sick man <coughs> in the bed and the infusion is dropping into his veins, but it's not the cure. It's it's something that keeps him alive and sick at the same time. I see. So he can stay like this and he's not causing any trouble. <laughs> something like that. It's like mostly Now I understand why you don't want to be a poet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's I think I'm very proud of what I said right now because it's so true. And if anybody in Serbia asks me, I'll repeat. <laughs> but nobody asked me that. <laughs> so because actually the question is the sense of metaphysics, you said. I think I think it's a fancy way of saying that uh, the problems of, of poetry, it, it's an intellectual way, nice way of saying actually, you not know, fancy of saying that people, uh, that the, the problem is not in, found, the answer to the problem is not found within the literature, editors of this world. It's found in a much wider context, not only cultural policies, but even wider, uh, huge trends of behavioral patterns. And in Serbia, if you want to know what, what the state of affairs is, uh, there's two levels. The second level has many levels. It's our Serbian thing. <laughs> but the first level, is, I think it, it can be said it's international. It's like the need, the, the primitive, basic, almost biological need for symbolic expression, for for ex expressing yourself in sim any kind of symbolic language. It's, it can be dancing, it can be music, it can be, I don't know, body language. Uh, and for consuming this kind of content where, where the message is transferred through sim any kind of symbolic language, which is what makes us different from animals, this basic need, uh, this homo sapiens, thing uh, is being transferred to a different kind of philosophical uh, uh, pattern. Like 
you can see that we talk about <coughs> these days, change in movies. They're getting fast and superficial. Things are not happening to characters, they're happening to buses exploding and buildings collapsing and stuff like that. Uh, you can see it everywhere. Uh, you can see youth uh, not interested in anything slow and complex. Uh, the answers are uh, aren't easy. The, 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 the questions they're asking themselves are still difficult, but in terms of how do I get the thing from the billboard? How do I afford the car from the ad? Or the shoes from the window shop? It's, it's, uh, these questions are hard, but are not the hard questions poet asks themselves. So do you believe in fast food literature? Yeah, you know, uh, junk food is fast, <coughs> poison is also fast, you know, and some yes, cure, cures are also fast. Cures are also better. fast. Yeah. It's not it's not actually a question of being fast or slow actually. You know. In Serbia, uh, I don't I don't know anybody who ever bought uh, a book or poetry. Oh, no, I, uh, I don't know anybody who bought a book of poetry. I'm 41 years old. I don't remember anybody. I don't remember. Yeah. That's the correct thing, sorry. Part of my English. I don't remember. Whereas for me, uh, now I'm lying, I bought a book, but it was a, a couple of years ago, but it was a book for my bad. friend. <laughs> yeah. And I wanted to feel good. <laughs> So I bought it, and the next time we met, he gave me. Uh, so the same. Okay. <laughs> How can I refuse? Yeah. And actually, there are many magazines in Serbia. Almost every town has a magazine. Every political party has a magazine. We have lots of political parties, literary magazine, and they publish poetry. And at first glance, you can see, and you can say. There are many, many magazines where young people can publish. And it's true. It's true. It's not like all the capitalists like. And they're funded by local authorities or by ministry or something like that, these magazines. Okay, you can publish, but does someone read? Uh, these magazines, uh, you can buy them in, in bookstores. Nobody actually buys them, but they're, they're, uh, you can find them in libraries. And sometimes I go to the library and I see a magazine there's my name on it. And I'm like, it's me. It's me. Nobody touches it. Nobody touches it. Yeah. Uh, and actually, this is this is the thing that drops from the infusion. You know, and the local authorities and the ministry they give some money for for these magazines, and they give money for books or poetry. We have so many poets, really many poets. And that's the, that's the thing that keeps the poetry alive, and it's a good thing. Really. And even in the last couple of years, many young poets appear, new young poets appear, that, that have, some, have something, and uh, have energy. And this new kind of poetry in Serbia is heterogeneous. It, it's, it's like, it's everything. We have patriotic, we have uh, fantastic, down to earth, we have love, we have ev everything. Experimental, fragmentary, it's mostly all of it is fragmentary, it's weird, and some real good talents. But you don't have fragmentarism. <laughs> and, uh, and it's a good thing. Somebody paid for this, this workshop or for this, this little. Well, that's important. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> but on the other hand, through the same channel, it's always there's always a political background. So I hope to get to that. Yeah, and uh, the Ser Ser Serbia is of course everything about Serbia, other than the global trends of of fast moving uh, image supplements. Uh, Everything. Uh, no, the second level in Serbia is we're still, we're still stuck. So speaking in terms of psychology, what you're saying, I see that your uh, 
producing but not consuming, in a way. Uh, yeah. Martin, uh, in Switzerland things should be more stable. They are more stable. We had uh, uh, quite a big change in the book market lately because uh, before we had a price binding, that means that the, the, the same book costed the same price in every uh, bookshop. And now, as in Switzerland, people can often decide also on subjects, and cultural subjects are sometimes a little bit difficult. Um, and all the cultural people, they were against uh, dissolving this book by, uh, binding, uh, price binding because the huge stores they can uh, easily sell books uh, cheaper and they mostly sell bestsellers, American authors or wherever, criminal stories. And so they compete with your own authors? And yeah, and terrible. the smaller uh, bookshops that, uh, for example, also uh, sell a lot of uh, poetry and where you have somebody knowing the books and then look at this, um, they have a problem competing on this price level. And this was uh, abolished. People decided we don't want this book, uh, uh, this price binding. So now it's uh, everybody but is watching a little bit how this will uh, develop. And a lot of people are afraid that even more the poetry and a little bit more complex part of literature will, will be uh, yeah, will become smaller. But on the other hand, we have. Uh, I don't know if that you have that too. We have a strange uh, development. I don't know if it's poetry, if it's something else. It's called uh, um, poetry slams. Yes. It's a uh, spoken word poetry and uh, long yeah. And uh, very often it's it's like comedy or it's it's, it's to make people laugh. But uh, from time to time, some very good poets come out of this scene too. And it's quite important in Switzerland because very often uh, people write in uh, standard German. We talk in Swiss German. That's like a dialect of, of uh, or more than one dialect of, uh, of German. And those poetry slammers very often write in uh, in this dialect. So uh, now we also have uh, poetry published in Swiss German dialect. Of course, the audience then is more restrained, but it's uh, for the self-image uh, of the language, maybe it's, a, it's a, an interesting thing. And we had, for example, I don't know if it was two or three years ago, even a novel published uh, in Swiss German that was very, very su successful. It's you know our common friend, Borja Bakunia, told us that uh, they were very proud when, uh, especially in Barcelona, uh, to publish in Catalan. Uh, and uh, all the Catalan poets that are very good are very well spread and they sell better than the uh, Spanish poets that uh, uh, write in Spanish. You know? uh, and I think it's, it's, it's a very good thing that uh, you promote your, uh, this dialect, you know, because uh, it, it in somehow it, it also has a dimension of, uh, I don't know, it's something like it's yours, it's uh, not uh, in a nationalist way, but something more uh, cozy, like at home, you feel at home in this language, you know, uh, and uh, those, I think, uh, those things could uh, impress and uh, convince uh, a man that speaks the same language as you to buy it, you know, priority before the uh, uh, common German. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, what do you know about the, the book prices in France? Is there a unique price or...? Well, yes, this is a good question and uh, when I uh, heard Ma Martin uh, saying that in Switzerland the prices are not free, um, I have to say that in the European Union it's not the case. Um, and the French, uh, they fought a lot uh, to impose this uh, uh, law because just because of the same argument as he said, uh, big uh, bookstores are able to sell books uh, at a lower price while uh, small uh, book uh, shops are not. And um, 
this would disadvantage uh, the local uh, network of distribution. And the French uh, fought against this um, at the, at the levels of, uh, of uh, European yes, uh, uh, decision. And they succeeded to impose this. And I think that it's a good thing. I, well, I, I, lived, I lived in France, and so I'm, I'm marked by this uh, kind of uh, cultural uh, ambience. And I think it's good. Uh, because this gives uh, a chance to, to small uh, bookstores, uh, small distributors to sell everywhere. Nevertheless, the, the editors are uh, free to, to sell their uh, books um, cheaper uh, during the book fairs or whatever, or this kind of uh, cultural uh, event that we are in. And uh, so there is a kind of flexibility, but it's limited. And um, I think that um, from, my, from my point of view, it's, it's fine. Uh, what is important it is to have a cultural animation around because we are so uh, accustomed now with animation. Everything has to be performative and spectacular uh, to, to sell or to be uh, consumed. So even poetry should, uh, uh, is obliged to, uh, to use this kind of mechanism, as you said, the slam, but also what, it, what you uh, are doing uh, during this uh, festival and uh, book for, which is very well come, welcome. I mean, we need a kind of cultural animation which might mean many things, yes. from uh, superficial to profound, academic, uh, serious, and so on. And uh, I think both uh, uh, powers should exist. The comic one, the sympathetic, uh, spectacular, uh, dancing, music, and so on, but also it, it is very important to have the serious power. I mean, to give seriousness uh, to poetry, because poetry is very serious. <laughs> I, uh, I have to. Uh, but to you have to listen this. to it or read it to it. <laughs> and uh, poets should take themselves very, very seriously. And to, uh, and to, uh, to assert every moment and in every situation that what poetry is, is very serious and, as you said, uh, necessary, vital, important for literature, for the language of a country, for uh, the psyche of people and for, for the metaphysics sense of our lives. If we are serious and we believe very much in this, then the others will, will uh, also believe. We can hope this. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I've seen in London, uh, I was at the London Book Fair this year, and uh, they were having this discussion about the unique price in books, and they said that they're sorry now, after a few years, that they uh, uh, passed over the law that France, uh, that France managed to, to keep, uh, because uh, their market <coughs> now is very unstable. Uh, there are lots of small bookshops that are closing their doors and uh, uh, big, huge, enormous uh, bookshops uh, that uh, where you cannot control the quality of the product because they're selling what uh, the public asks for uh, while in the little bookshops like, uh, you know, in France is like Shakespeare uh, 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 and Shakespeare, yes. Uh, well, you know, you, you, you go there and you ask for a book or ask them to recommend you something and you're sure that you, they will recommend you a good book. You cannot do that in the supermarket, for example, because firstly, n no librarian from the supermarket knows what they hold there. Uh, <clears throat> so it's uh, losing somehow the control over the quality. And uh, on the other side, it's... Uh, uh, obliging uh, some uh, professional librarian to retire. Uh, librarian is uh, 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 book to retire. Okay. Uh, now I want to say a few words from the editor's perspective. Uh, it's not such a joy to publish uh, a poetry book. <laughs> Firstly, because uh, publishing a poetry book costs exactly the same as publishing a novel. Uh, 
the difference from uh, 80, 90, 100 pages to 200 pages, in, uh, it's not that important. Uh, a novel sells, a poetry book doesn't sell that good. You have to promote it third times, four times better than a novel to assure yourself that uh, you can have, uh, I don't know, like half of uh, 100 copies sold if you uh, have uh, 300 copies for that book. Uh, after that, there's a big problem with the, uh, the uh, people that distribute, uh, the, uh, that sell uh, the book. <coughs> they, they take you from the start 50% of the book's price. So, you, if they sell, if they sell, you only have 50% from the book to cover your expenses. But most commonly they don't sell. Because in all the bookshops, the book poetry books are uh, hidden somewhere. Very good. On the up shelves or uh, behind the curtain, you know, it's somewhere you, you don't find them. Uh, and even if they sell and you have that 50% of the book that you have to cover the investition, uh, they pay you that small amount of money, they pay you only after six months, a year, you know, it's uh, so they keep your money and you, you cannot use your own money to make other books. So, uh, all editors, if you ask them, say you have to be crazy to publish poetry books. Uh, most of them don't publish poetry books, and, uh, but there are a few editors in Romania that still do that, and I'm, I'm very happy that uh, we have a handful of crazy men uh, that are interested. And I would uh, remember uh, uh, Vina of, uh, Publishing House, uh, Carmida's Publishing House, uh, uh, Herb Bennett Publishing House, uh, Max Blecher, uh, Traco Sarte, and Carta uh, Munasca, of course, and that's it. Uh, we have seven publishing houses that actually publish poetry with a program. I'm not talking about the editors that to publish from now to then a poetry book. I'm talking about editors that publish it with a program. And this kind of program, it's important to make a conscience, to uh, continuously provoke the audience. Uh, and most of all, it's important to preserve uh, your poet's population. Because they know they have uh, an escape. They have somewhere where they can publish a book. And that... Uh, that, I think, they, it keeps them somehow alive, and that's very important. Uh, that's what I had to say. Uh, if you have any other comments or uh, uh, questions from, uh, from the audience? You raised earlier the problems of uh, big bookstores promoting foreign um, authors <coughs> in each of uh, your country, especially in Eastern Europe. I think that we have uh, here the same problem, like big uh, editors like Humanitas, uh, Nemira, uh, they are promoting like hell uh, bestsellers from outside. Yes. Usually all those books come with a precise uh, marketing kit already done just to be translated and adapted here. And uh, the public is somehow uh, overwhelmed. Uh, with uh, this uh, info. Uh, it's a lot of noise, if you want, in terms of publicity and marketing. Obviously, this affects the uh, book market. What do you think that it can be done to uh, fight back on this uh, uh, noise? Maybe who should consider to have a proper marketing for uh, uh, national authors. For example, as I know in Romania, the only author with a proper internationally quality marketing is uh, Mircea Cartarescu. And that's it, if you are talking to an international level, yes? <coughs> Who should uh, address this problem? No, no, government, uh, publishing houses, bookstores. It's just a question, I don't have the answer. Well, it's, it's a matter of 
that's point because, uh, like I know in the States, uh, there are only 3% uh, book that were translated. Yes. In England, uh, it's the same in France. It's, yeah, same. It, like in the Western world, that's, they're just, you know, they're, they're just helping their authors and. And like three percent doesn't mean that it's uh, like little because okay, Ivan, but three percent from three million, yeah, okay. Would you like to continue your ideas? Yes. Okay. Well, I, I don't have like uh, I just uh, like you know some. It's the difference between the West and the East that uh, we are all always like looking at the West and the artists and forgetting about ours. You just I don't have a solution. Well if I I may try an answer to what uh, you are asking. Um, I think that uh, we are in the process of learning how to market our cultural products better and better. Uh, I mean, countries like ours, which are small countries from Central Eastern South uh, Europe. And this is, uh, of course, by contamination with the Western system and uh, more and more by uh, sort of competition with them. We are learning and we are evolving. And I'm mm, rather positive from this point of view. I think that we are in a crescendo uh, uh, period and uh, we are starting to uh, promote our authors better. You mentioned Mircea Terterescu, I might add uh, Lucian Boya recently, who, who is an, a historian and who is very well sold on the French market, but there are others, uh, smaller maybe as a fame, but who are um, uh, climbing on, on this kind of uh, hierarchy. What I mean is that we are learning, and this is very important, uh, how to uh, promote our authors. And uh, for example, uh, this kind of festival, I insist, is a way of promoting poetry and authors and poet poetry books. But we have to take ourselves very seriously. Yes. For example, I, I buy books. I, I do not agree with you. I mean, I, yesterday I, I, I bought two books, but I intend not to go and buy some more other books, be, because they are e cheaper here. To be honest, I also do buy books of my friends and of the poets and writers that I know that I like, but uh, in general, in general, m my friends, friends of my friends, my colleagues, for instance, I buy a book in, my, in the company I work for, it's like 18 people, I buy it, I read it. I bring it to my job, and who wants to read it, take it from me. This is nice. It's not nice. Five people, <laughs> five people uh, read the book, paid, only one of them paid for it. You know? <laughs> Did you encourage, encourage them to buy it? No. <laughs> no. If they wouldn't. I want to come back a little for uh, what you asked, and I, I guess we still have a problem. Uh, our common public lacks an authority. You know, uh, they need someone to inspire them trust, to tell them that's a good book, you have to buy it. Uh, when they see, I don't know, Salman Rushdie or uh, I don't know, any other books, they first, the name Salman Rushdie imposes. After that, they see on the back cover, it says, uh, I don't know, Herald Tribune or uh, New Yorker. And that what really make them buy. We don't have something like this in Romania. We don't have an authority uh, important or trustable enough to impose an auction. Uh, and I think we should try to create something like this. We should try to create a system, even if like any system uh, with power, somehow they, uh, uh, they may uh, go wrong, but uh, we should have uh, something that allows us to promote our own authors for the common audience that needs someone to tell them what to do. Sure. And for instance, we have, you know, Roland Ortic, Hungarian poet, the translator, the professor. He had his book, uh, published on, on the 
children on the book fair in Belgrade, the last one, and he came to Belgrade and he, we saw it and I bought one copy and he gave me another. And I, it's, it's a poetry book. And I brought it to my job and we exchanged prose often. And I said, I wrote the poetry book, it's my friend. He's a great Hungarian poet. His poems are beautiful. No, really. And, and I have a colleague, we're copywriters, we write screenplays for ads, we, have, we live for, we, I write for a living, but I write lies. <laughs> and uh, she's, uh, she studied English literature, my friend and colleague. Very smart, reads a lot. But she hadn't read any poetry ever since she read what she had to for the studies. Yeah. And she's like, Really? Read it. Okay. It's your friend. <laughs> and she brought it back several weeks later and said, it's nice, it's nice. And everybody heard it. Everybody heard it, it's my friend. Everybody heard it, that he had this book published now, that he stayed at my flat, that she read it and that she said it's good and it stood on my table for, for days. No, it took it. But if I brought prose, even Serbian prose that I that I read mostly from the library, uh, they take it. They take it. But it's also a question of uh, patience. Uh, if uh, if you continue to do this little by little, I, I will. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I will. I will. It's a question of emulation. Uh, and imitation. People, yes. uh, if you go, we if you give a good example, people will start to. We imitate. need to be persistent, and I don't agree that we. Uh, the question of philosophy. Maybe Martin is a professor of philosophy, and Romanus, he might be able to answer it better. But from what I see, it's not true that we're not living in an organism that whose thinking, whose collective thinking, is not defined by a philosophical system. It's just that this system that defines our collective thinking is a pseudo-philosophical materialistic consumerism. And it's not a philosophical system you, you would, uh, you, uh, not something you would call philosophical system when you studied philosophy or read about philosophical systems of the history of civilization. It's something new. And when you say, and when you say uh, too many data, there are two ways for data to be too many. One is we're being bombarded by uh, by this collective thinking uh, icons and symbols and patterns and uh, wished behavior from from billboards. I write a job <laughs> and stuff from ads, from movies, we're, we've been bombarded by the patterns of thinking we're expected to do. Work, spend, work, spend. Your status is higher if you buy this and stuff like that. And, and uh, this is the value, this is the value, this is the value, this is the, what is the value. And uh, I think in a way it's being done purposefully, on purpose, somebody's consciously orchestrating this to make us uh, confused and lost, you know, and then to find uh, our identity in what's on the menu. And this is on the menu, you know. And another way for data to be too many is uh, when the data is contradicting itself. Mm -hmm. In Serbia, it's like we're still divided between patriots and traitors. Patriots who say Serbia suffered in wars and Serbia suffered always and we are heroic people and everybody hates us. And the, the traitors, in my mind, the real patriots, are saying we need to face the fact that we made war crimes. We need to face it, we need to talk about it, we need to admit it if we want to go on. And both sides have poets. <laughs> both sides have talented poets. <laughs> yeah. And this is the this is the, the drops that come out. Of one, one party you know gives the drops of this kind, the other part of that kind. 
and maybe it's also difficult out from the situation we are in to say we don't have or we have a philosophical system. If you say in the end uh, few poets will stay, it's history that does this. When you look back you see, ah, this was the time, for example, we are living in the end of the time where we had a lot of different philosophical systems at the same time competing yes. and uh, even uh, a philosophy or postmodern philosophy that is going maybe to the end that says everything is the same or something like that. We cannot uh, tell from the view after what will stay. Mm -hmm. It's. Uh, I am sure even if the, in the times when now we say, ah, oh, it was this philosophical systems, these philosophers were very important, even then there were other systems also. But uh, when you look back, you see something and you say, ah, oh, it was this. I don't know. And uh, in, for the poets, I mean, there are poets that f for them it's very important this uh, metaphysical side of their poetry, uh, the, the meaning between the words and uh, the, the symbolistic, the simple meaning, simple, symbolistic meaning. And there are other poets that for them it's very important to work the surface and uh, the, the material of the word and the material, the, the surface of what we see. <coughs> We will see how, what will stay in the end. Yeah, but but uh, the, the problem, the main problem is that uh, all this you're saying, of course, perfectly sure, perfectly sure, you know, is much better than I do. But it's been marginalized in the public eye. For instance, two thousand years ago, Jesus Christ was just one of the guys who stepped on the rock and say something and gets his followers. Just one of them. There were piles of messiahs. Uh, several hundred years ago, Shakespeare was playing his place in the street for the people, and if you're boring, if you're bad, they would throw tomatoes. <laughs> really, I would love to see this again. <laughs> really, this would be this would, this would be brilliant for theater, for for poetry, for anything. Now, you have audience always. <laughs> Give them tomatoes. <laughs> Give them the courage to do so. And now, uh, you, you, what you're saying, the philosoph philosophers, philosophers of tomorrow, the decade that to come, will see what you're talking about, what was here at the moment. But it's retreated to the academy, to the educated discussions like this, not including me, <laughs> you know? And it's not in the question in the public eye. And I think what, what made it retreat to the academia is the materialistic consumerism that I, that I said. Yeah, but uh, on the other hand, uh, compared to the time of Shakespeare, we have much more people who can read nowadays. You know, it, I mean, it was always a, a small community that was really receiving that and uh, discussing all these things. Uh, now we have a lot of people who can read, but only a few of them read uh, maybe Poetry or philosophy books, uh, but that should be it doesn't easy. mean that in the end uh, it will also, uh, how do you say, tri trickle down or from. Yeah. It would be interesting if, if there was research, uh, if there's a different percentage of people uh, asking themselves these kind of questions, did, did this percentage rise with the rise of literacy? Mm. You know, or if, like, the same percentage. <coughs> Had these discussions uh, in time of Shakespeare and now, and the, the number of literate people has risen, but they are only literate to fill in forms, <laughs> you know, in banks. <laughs> that would be an interesting research, because I suspect that that would be the case. All the innovation, all the philosophical, let's say, breakthrough, poetry is trying just uh, in order to get the new, uh, get something new, it seems to me that somehow uh, 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 lose the public. I would say it's a question of education. Uh, young people learn what poetry is in the school uh, and uh, they uh, 
go out of school with a, a, a clear and stacked idea what poetry is. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, modern and contemporary poetry should be uh, educated, should be uh, taught uh, to young people in order to be understood. It's not only a question of rhyme and uh, rhythm and uh, images. Modern poetry is not like this. And you have huge modern and contemporary poets. Uh, who are also metaphysical, who will use symbols and uh, uh, profound images. It's not a question of rhyme and, ri and uh, rhythm. It's well, I, people I, have to be educated in it. I guess it's very hard to lose the rhythm because a modern poetry needs the rhythm. Uh, yes, I, I'm sure it's a problem of education. I agree with you. And uh, it's an old discussion. It, and it's even a discussion of uh, genders. If there still, uh, if there still exist transgenders, uh, uh, in the 70s they prefer to say genre, genre, genre. genre. literally genre. Literally genre. <laughs> <laughs> they prefer to, to to refer a poetry or I don't know uh, as text. No, it's it's just a text. It's not. Uh, it's not a poetry. It's a text, and if it sounds to you like a poetry, you can say it's poetry. Uh, I don't think the public uh, feels that much, sees that much. Uh, I don't think the public, the common public, has. The, you are speaking about 20 high school students, no? Uh, they don't have the necessary tools, you know? They lack the tools and. Uh, Yes, but they love Bukowski, <coughs> for example. Okay. And they don't like uh, Sochu. Bukowski for example. doesn't have it. For right. us, it's uh, somehow in the same niche, but it's, uh, they receive it very it's differently. A, they love Bukowski because it's something that uh, it's, I don't know, it's very hexed <laughs> and very uh, out of the line. And uh, at that age, they need, they, they, they are looking and searching for. Uh, big characters uh, with uh, things that could uh, go, I don't know, out of the circle, and uh, uh, that's important. But they don't like Bukowski because they understand Bukowski. They like Bukowski's attitude, you know? Uh, when they get to understand Bukowski, they may still love Bukowski, but they love also other poets, because they know how to read poetry. Yes, but attitude is important. Yes, yes. Uh, a serious, yes, profound, you, and engaged attitude is yes, very much Yes, but attitude changes, and so is your reading. Because uh, when you're reading Bukowski at 30 years, you read it different. Yeah, you're, search, yes. you're searching different attitudes there. Yeah, case of my wife. <laughs> she loves Bukowski, and she loves all poetry. If you discuss about this, and of course that marketing uh, has a lot to do, and uh, there are these inter-art forms that can help a little bit, and so on and so forth. But I wanted to remind you, if you, you may also know this, that because this is a general situation in schools, that poetry is really not at any advantage. Uh, very poor poetry is given. Okay, when you are a little kid, you have these nursery rhymes, then you have those silly, very often silly patriotic poems in the smaller school. And then by the time, and that time will come very soon, by the time when uh, they grow a little bigger, a little older, they have already chosen some profession that has nothing to do with poetry or with arts in general, because this is in general about the arts. So one of the beatniks, Kenneth Koch, together with some friends, uh, made an experiment and they taught poetry to uh, children uh, between 6 and 16 and they had an incredible result. I read two books about this. Well, they were uh, reading to them. Um, first of all, of course, they started, and especially with the small ones, with Blake's poems, with ti poem with the tiger, tiger burning bright in the forest of the night, which has the rhythm and, the, you know, the hook towards it. And the description of the experience of reading this poem uh, was very interesting to see because the six-year-old ones, some of them could not even really write, you know. Uh, so they learned a, a lot from the poem. Of course, they liked the tiger. They were children. They could imagine it. They learned about symmetry. They could see their, they, they, it was totally fascinating. <coughs> now, how they did this thing? They had no shyness about telling the poem. 
Therefore, let us see what is here. And they told the story. Then they kind of decomposed it, more or less. And they proposed his children to write their own poems, either per one animal, another tiger, another symmetrical thing. And you know, uh, in accordance with the age, they had all these uh, little experiences. After they themselves wrote one or two or three versions, and they had a variety of doing it, counter music, or uh, they uh, even uh, gave them European poetry in translation, German and French, very important poems from those cultures. And well, after they themselves wrote something, they read that poem again, the one that was the basic, uh, you know, the starting point. And they could see the total transformation of the listening. And then what was the big conclusion? They also experimented this in some African countries. At the end of the books, they had some anthologies. And I must say that the little African children, they were much more interesting. I mean, they had a very extraordinary, genuine way to really answer these themes, these things. And the conclusion of these, all this experiment, there will not be more poets in this group, which was very numerous in the end, but they will forever be good readers of poetry. And so this goes towards any other arts, and indeed the school is very much to be blamed for the passive attitude towards real value. So here yes. you have it. Yes. I'm glad that you and I have only mentioned this because I remember now that in France, where, as I said, I lived there for a while, there was a study um, uh, um, done by the philosopher Michel Serres, Serres uh, about uh, poetry in the French systems, uh, educational system, uh, and the conclusion was terrible that poetry is disappearing because it is not a, a taught in, in uh, the uh, school books, and um, uh, uh, they tried afterwards to improve this uh, situation because they realized that um, um, reading poetry was useful for creativeness, as you said, but also for diction and for rhetoric, for the way a, a young person uh, learns to express himself or herself. And this will end for memory, but uh, and, and, and cultural uh, consciousness in general. So they realized it was very important to have poetry uh, taught in, in schools for these reasons. Yeah, this is a very and now basic. Now it's it's a, 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 it's imposed in a way. And, and it's not about the, more selling. Uh, no, I, w I wanted to say one more thing because she uh, explained it in this way that she reminded me of a very recent experience. I'm older and my school was very good. I learned in a, an extraordinarily beautiful school and it was a very good school at my time, Scuola Centrale. There we had a kind of, uh, really almost an, an illuminated kind of surrounding. We never missed an exhibition. It's, it was a very good school. But, and so poetry too was uh, honored at its right place. Now, uh, I had a little experience recently, I knew it through my own children, that in fact the way in which uh, poetry is taught in school is in fact deeply discouraging any pleasure. I mean those ready-made comments which are horrific, I mean they would discourage anyone, you have to be heroic to still love poetry afterwards. And you know, <laughs> I. It was a certain situation where I tried my hand, but it was meant to be just personal, a personal uh, communication with a friend of mine from England. I uh, translated for her a poem by Eminescu, that I, Eminescu, our national poet, who is, uh, usually has rhymes, you know, and it's very difficult to translate, and he is almost a caricature in many of the translations. So I wanted to uh, share his poem, um, um, a poem that doesn't have rhyme, you know, and uh, which was really also very much deformed in translation. It is very, uh, it is very simple. It has a simple dignity. Nu credam să învățam This is a wonderful line for which I translated the poem. Okay. Now this lady wanted to publish it. I was appalled. I said, don't publish it. <laughs> of course, it was just a, you know a sketch. In the end, she did publish it, and she wanted a comment from me about the poem. Now, I didn't want to uh, just invent it, so I googled. And I found so many of these horrible comments that this is how I discovered that you would be totally discouraged. Of course, I learned from those comments a few objective facts about the poem. Thank you. But then the comments were so horrible. And they misunderstood the poem totally. And this is what they get in schools. 
This is what I copy from Google. Yes, I, I like very much uh, what you described in the experiment before. I, as I work also as a teacher, uh, I always, but it's also because I write, I try to uh, make the students answer what they read by creative texts and not by intellectual commentaries that are interesting and important also, but for the first, yeah, for the first touch with uh, with a poem, I think yeah. it's it's uh, more interesting to be inspired by yeah. it, to to make something else, uh, yeah. something personal out of it, you know, to yeah. produce a little text, maybe with other techniques, whatever that answers uh, the poem. Mm -hmm. But uh, a lot of teachers, they are not writers. They go to university and they learn the commentaries and they learn this intellectual uh, discourse about poetry mm -hmm. and then they try to uh, teach the students uh, what is an interpretation of and the poem. And it kills, it kills, yeah. the, thing. It kills uh, the reception. I told uh, Sinisha yeah. yesterday, uh, uh, in my university, uh, my students in the first year, well, I don't get them from the first year, I get them from the second year, and in the second year they don't know how to read a poem or an album. So mainly the seminars I do with them are uh, close reading ses sessions because I have to teach them how to read. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I do is read with them and I only tell them pay attention to that. I don't tell them never how to interpret it. I just say pay attention. And after that they can develop their own interpretation. Mm -hmm. uh, and. Uh, some are bizarre, some are absurd, but it, there are some points of view uh, that uh, I don't know, provokes the intellect, uh, and that's good, and that's how they learn how to read, because uh, firstly they they know where to look and what to search for, and after that how they interpret it is their own business, but they they have to know what to search, and they don't know when they get them in university in second year. When you have them on your hands, they are already spoiled by all these texts, yes. which are really, really deadly. You know that. Yeah. The conclusion would be that we have to educate uh, teachers, <laughs> librarians, <laughs> booksellers, uh, editors, uh, uh, journalists, media journalists, and so on. Congratulations. Uh, it, it seems to me that in Switzerland they go much more often in schools to read. The writers. Ah, don't also, yeah. I think they yeah, have a lot of uh, programs um, financially supported uh, by different institutions where writers go to schools and they give workshops and things like that. So, and that will but it's not be a, a, an impression which is alive. It's yeah, it's also very often it's good, but not always. But I just want to very briefly to structure something and I will talk as a marketing manager, which I was so many years, several years, including in a publishing house, which I would not like to be ever in this life, maybe in the next. Uh, I have tried to uh, understand the system from the interior, working in this publishing house, and now I think that I have the two sides of the problem, as a poet and as a person who is in charge to promote poetry. And uh, first of all, uh, regarding the title of our workshop, uh, do we have a poetry market? My answer is very clear. No, we don't have a mar um, poetry market. And it's not clear to, to Romania or to Eastern Europe country. There is not such a market. And we don't have to, we don't we do not have to blame on the publishing house because the publishing house is a company. They have to pay bills for electricity. They have to have a cash flow. They have to have everything in order to publish books. Okay, so I will not advise any poets to be <laughs> the manager of me because he really needs strong. <laughs> professionals to survive. Even I was going even farther. I was going to talk with a lot of people who have bookstores. Uh, and I asked them why the uh, poet 
poetry books are not promoted in their bookstores or they are not even stored. And they told me that, you know, lady, it was, you know, lady, uh, in order to have a very good bookstore, you need to be on a main road. You know which is the rent for this kind of space, in a main road or in a avenue or something like this. You remember, you must understand that every uh, inch of my shelf, it's a cost. And it's not cost effective to put the uh, uh, poem, uh, book with poems. Even uh, what, what I can, because I'm very generous as a luxury, I can have maybe two meters of this kind of thing in my whole economy. And you have to understand this because this is like common sense economical law. You cannot fight it. It's like you fight with the rain or something like this. So from this point of view, I think that we should uh, split the idea of book as a product and the idea of poetry book as a product and the idea of poetry book as a message of metaphysics. Because for sure in the, the history of the spirituality of human race, it's the history of the human spirituality. And in this human spirituality, poetry, the need of poetry, the metaphysic which is illustrated by poetry has a very clear, uh, has a very clear space. So uh, I'm quite sure that poetry will not vanish, even in this kind of environment. I don't know what shapes will take in the future, because we are not talking only about poetry, but we are talking about the vanishing the books of paper. So I'm quite sure that even in 20 years from now, poetry will exist, maybe not on paper, maybe it will be another support, I don't know, but this is the trend that we have to live with. And the last thing, it's like poetry was always in the history a niche. I mean, when you decide to become poet, nobody is telling you that it will be nice, easy, or uh, it will be something that will uh, bring you a great success. So I think that we have to, when we decided to become poem, po what when we decided to write poems, and we have to assume a kind of conditions, which is, this was the condition during the century. I mean, the 21st century did not bring something new in this area. I mean, that a poet is not promoted like uh, it's a novel, uh, novel writer. It's like, I don't know, an international chess player is complaining that he is not visible like a football player. Okay, it's not, but you choose to be international chess player. And I think that this kind of assuming of condition of the poet, of the poetry, will bring us to a more efficient way to make poetry visible. Yes, but in literature you can do them both, you know, you can write poetry and prose. You can play chess and football. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you all. Uh, I guess it was a nice discussion. I liked it, at least. <laughs> I liked it. <laughs> and uh, see you later. <laughs>